at NPC, which I've been doing for almost a decade. And, uh, you know, this time a fully virtual event, which is awesome to see the kind of scope and reach that we have been able to achieve. And the guest today with me is Mohit Patnagar. Mohit Patnagar, who most of you would know, is almost synonymous with Sequoia in India. Mohit is the managing director of Sequoia Capital in India and has been focusing on technology investments in the early stage businesses, especially across mobile internet, payments, and SaaS or software as a service sector. He is the lead advisor on investments in Freshworks, Zomato, Oyo Rooms, Daily Hunt, Misho, Cost24, and the list goes on, which shows that he has his pulse on what is worth investing from India. He has been, uh, like me, a telco executive to start with, and I'm seeing that he was with Ericsson, then with Airtel, and probably you'll find some things to talk about and how we see a lot of the investments came from the base of the telco people. So Mohit, thank you very much for your time and welcome to NPC. Uh, Mohit is just doing this tech clicks uh, sort out. I'll tell you more about what Mohit has been doing. So Mohit, uh, you know, also started, co-founded a company called Brightpod based out of the US, which was actually in the telco space. It's a wireless startup. And then when he came to India, and that's like quite a few years ago, he actually was also the investor in con companies like Citrus Pay, which got acquired by PayU, Prison Payments, which got acquired by Hitachi, and with Ujjivan Microfinance, which went IPO. And Mohit and I have seen this ecosystem develop, and that ecosystem has changed substantially. And what we are going to talk about today when Mohit is back is about what's happening with the ecosystem. Mohit, you're back. I am, uh, but can you hear me, PK? Yeah. Yes, you can. We can. Wonderful. Okay, let's let's start. So, Mohit, the f the first question. You, you know, you have high or have got old in this ecosystem. We've been watching it for so many years. It makes it look kind of dates us, and the ecosystem has changed. But the biggest change actually came in the last year. The 2020 was the biggest change maker. You know. We have come to a world which has changed. It's almost like a year ago, we could never have expected what all went through it. What are the biggest changes that you've seen in this year, both positive and negative, and how this will go forward in the coming years? Uh, great question, PK. Um, I've been doing this much like you for a while, and, and I guess when you're in the uh, forest every day, you don't sort of realize the changes that they're happening to you because you're so part of it. But just the sheer number of 2020 allowed us to almost take a decade back look and a decade forward look and puts things in perspective when you look in those time frames. Okay, the word that comes to my mind uh, to answer your question is mindset. I think mindsets have shifted. Uh, in a positive way, uh, there is a genuine belief in the founders today in India. There's a genuine belief in the investors today in India, that the outcomes of our companies, our startups uh, can be very material, can be world-class. What used to take 10 to 12 years to create a company for $100 million of revenue now is happening between four to five years. The pace of acceleration of market cap creation is unprecedented. We're seeing second time founders, we're seeing CXOs from others successful uh, startups step out and the self-belief that they come to the table with, that this will happen, it's just a matter of time that will happen, is very different than it was, say, 10 years back when all of us were tentative, unsure whether it would really happen in, 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 a, in, a, uh, in a quick a period of time or not. So I would say mindset a belief that this is going to be large and be material is the single biggest change that I've noticed on the positive side. Specifically on 2020, I would say the word resilience <laughs> comes out over and over again from yeah. everything we read and we experience, isn't it? Uh, there, were, there would not have been even one of us in March 2020 who would not have been anxious. Anxious for, you know, how do you survive in a situation where your revenues have not dipped? They've gone to zero. How do you survive? Right. 
when you are not classified as an essential service and literally all your people on the ground are not allowed to do what they do which is attend go to the warehouses or do the deliveries and so on and so mm. forth and when you look back in december and you look back at the year and you're like oh my god not only did we survive we actually thrived we actually did all right we're back to pre covid levels in most companies across the board we're leaner and meaner in cost structures and more ruthless in terms of prioritization of what these companies do so they're much more solid and strong uh, you know from the inside uh, it gives you a sense that look if i could survive 2020 and i could thrive in 2020 then there is no freaking way i can't sort of deal with whatever world's going to throw at me in the next few years right so i would yeah. say self belief and this new found superpower of resilience is a wonderful way for us to sort of start the decade very good boy very very articulately put so my next question would be that if you see that do you see specific sectors doing it or is it across the board or are there certain sectors which have better headwinds than others okay uh, you know when we used to be asked this question uh, five eight years back we used to say we're going to invest in the technology sectors but that's almost uh, you cannot say that anymore any sector is today getting disrupted by technology and we've talked that's about right. it in the past with education healthcare financial services literally every sector that's of certain size and shape has an opportunity for it to get disrupted by uh, folks within that sort of embracing technology and allowing them to do so but still within that massive menu of opportunity i'll pick up four or five sectors and just sort of lay them out for you and why we are excited about uh you know investing a lot more dollars and time and effort into them the first one uh, has got to be saas and uh, you know specifically developer tools if you will within it today india has maybe five or six companies that are unicorns uh, that have gotten to over 100 mm-hmm. dollars of uh, of revenue uh, will uh, be very successful we expect that number we closer to 25 to 30 companies more in this next 5 to 7 years that will grow what in the double digit million arr but are either doubling or tripling depending upon which markets they're going after and are very likely to become 100 million dollar plus arr companies in the next 5 uh, to 7 years and if that happens then you see these many unicorns getting born so saas as a sector um you know both going after the smb opportunity going after the mid market opportunity going after both horizontal and vertical solutions is a big area of focus for us you know as a, a anecdote for this is we run a seed program called surge and uh, close to about 10 out of the 15 companies that formed the latest cohort in surge are actually saas companies so lots yeah. of young companies getting created uh, in the in the software as a service sector so that's one The second one I'll pick is social commerce and uh simplistically put the opportunity can be understood as follows today uh about 100 million people shop on um you know Amazon or Flipkart but there are over 5 6 500 million people who say good morning and good night to each other on WhatsApp so that's a clear gap of 400 million people who are very comfortable to be on the mobile internet but haven't taken the next step of actually putting out their credit cards on destination e-commerce mm-hmm. sites and so how does that population of 400 million people get comfortable by buying online and that's where things like social commerce come into play where people like influencers and assisted buying by housewives for their friends and family will play a great part for people to actually become you know online online consumers like much of us in 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 who are early adopters to the mobile internet uh, commerce world so social commerce i would say more broadly as a second big sector and thesis that we are focused on the third one is digital health and i think there's a nice session that arun was saying is lined up today very eager to sit through it and learn um clearly we all saw that in the world's worst pandemic none of us wanted to step into the hospitals and so this whole element of simplistic remote telemedicine is 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 here to stay it's a hygiene uh you know feature if you will for many healthcare companies going forward which we think is going to take further steam but more interestingly you know we were fortunate for example i'll give you an anecdote of a company we intersected with this year or last year uh, called twin health uh, that uses sensors and uses sensors mm-hmm. like those monitors and fitbits and you know weight machines to be able to very intelligently understand the metabolism in a human being's body using iot sensors and then uses you know very interesting predictive algorithms to try and reverse chronic diseases like even diabetes uh, results are mm-hmm. early, very early company but stunning results so far pk that's made me sit up and think that 
you know, this isn't science fiction. This isn't almost too good to be true, but this is fundamentally sound where you can actually use the power of technology of the mobile internet and sensors to actually cure people and get them out of, you know, hard to solve diseases. So very excited about health tech as the third sector for us to think through. Now this, this is the promise of IoT, if I remember. So really using the promise of IoT. You know, PK, it's stunning, actually. The founder is Jahangir, and uh, he ran a company called Jasper Wireless, and they ran... Oh, I know Jasper. You know Jasper. I know Jasper, yes, yes. So, so Jahangir had a aha moment, you know. Uh, they ran all of the sensors within Tesla cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tesla went through its own set of, you know, ups and downs of trying to, you know, improve the car performance. But he got a tremendous insight from there, which said that the Tesla car performance can actually get better over time because of the sensors that we are measuring and monitoring within it. And he said, if I could do that for a car, why can't we do that for a human you body? Can do it for the human being, yeah. Right? And awesome. It's a big idea and it works. So, so very, very excited about where this health tech space is going next. Uh, the fourth one quickly I'll just say is digitization of SMBs. Uh, you know, this has been a, uh, you know, India has over, call it 50 or 75 million SMBs. There are gonna be more SMBs in India than enterprises. And so the software opportunity in India really lies in the SMB sector, if you will. And traditionally, it's been very hard to reach software uh, to this base of customers because uh, there hasn't been a do-it-yourself. There hasn't been a, you know, I'll adopt it easily. There's been a lot of hand-holding, if you will. But that's changed. Mm -hmm. Our phone platforms that these people have, whether it's, you know, companies like Pagar Book or Khata Book or a number of them that we've experienced, the sheer adoption by SMBs of software to improve their own systems and to develop productivity in their own little small businesses is unprecedented. And we think that's going to change a lot of things uh, in, in that segment of society for India as well. And the last one I'll mention uh, is gaming. Uh, I would say uh -huh. a phenomenal opportunity in India, one that today has been dominated mostly by real money gaming companies. But the all you have to do is look at your young uh, children or your nephews and nieces and realize that if given a chance, they will use these mobile platforms uh, for entertainment around the gaming side. And uh, we still haven't seen massive unicorns get built down in India on the casual gaming side, for example, which we think will happen over this next decade. Awesome. Like, in fact, um, you know, I could go through each one of them from Freshworks as your like the SaaS like a pioneer, you know, you know, Misho as a social commerce places where you have actually found the best companies literally and the first leaders in these space. The bigger question, Mohit, is how do you find them? What do you look for in a founder? How do you, you know, find this awesome crop of people which come and work with you? Well, honestly, we are, we are privileged and fortunate that these uh, folks that you're referring to choose us as a partner. And uh, before I say anything else that makes it sound like we always get it right, remember that uh, there are more times we get it wrong than we get it right. And that's the only way we get better. And so much like everyone else, we have our share of you know arrows on our back and blood on our shoes. Uh, I've been doing this for 15 years. And if I walked you through all the things that I made mistakes on, we would run out of time on this panel. Um, learning, 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 as they say, learning. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I think it's it's an important point, and I'll broad base the answer, PK, to say that um, the raw material in our business is, is uh, founders and management teams that these founders build around them. And the quality of teams that we are seeing uh, who are stepping out of, you know, comfy um, companies or, or choosing to not be in the U.S. but come back to India and build is uh, never been better. Um, mm -hmm. I would say, I, I don't know the exact percentage, but it would certainly be a very significant percentage of companies that got funded by VCs last year would probably be second time founders. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the second time founder class doesn't need to be coached on the basics. Uh, they know how to play the game. They know how to build uh, management teams uh, way before they're needed, if you will. Uh, they understand that it's a war for talent, not money. And if you can get the best people to come work with you on your mission of building the next large company in India, you've, that's half the battle, just you know, building that, that high quality team that works well uh, together. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say the founder quality is, is unprecedented. And, and maybe now the challenge for us here is to sort of uh, really focus on diversity and inclusion and make sure, for example, the uh, women participation 
uh, is is mm-hmm. represented in our founder groups. It's still a very very low number in India uh, across the new businesses getting funded, startups getting funded, and all of us as an ecosystem need to do a whole lot more to inspire and encourage a lot of the women founders to step up because we we feel like that is still lagging where it needs to be by by a huge amount. So I was speaking earlier to Sairi Chahal who formed Shiro's and. you know we were talking about how to get more people like kind of core women to be active participants what do you think is one step that we could take to make that happen more or or increase that percentage substantially i think the first thing is we need to talk about it pk we need to first recognize it's a problem for of us to for all of us to look internally to see what we should all be doing more of in order to solve it it's it's for, for mm-hmm. too long not been something that we haven't spoken about and so we need to put that on the agenda on the center of the thing and then everyone is going to have wonderful ideas as to how to really address it um uh, you'll find mm-hmm. uh you know vc firms uh you know create pockets of capital you'll find folks in the ecosystem being willing to go the extra mile in terms of you know mentorship to allow and encourage uh young women founders to step forward and be successful we we'll, we already have in terms of you know falguni and others uh who have going to be you know massively inspirational as women founders to the next crop of uh women who mm-hmm. look sort of building these businesses um you know they're going to have to be specific programs around return to work for women who step out uh you know to have kids and for them to make it easy for them to come back into the work stream so they're going to be multiple ideas i don't think there's one magic wand that solves this but it all starts with us sort of saying hey it's a problem let's do something about it mm-hmm. So one of the bigger part of the audience I believe today is people who are wanna be founders or people who are product managers working for say a company which is building a substantial product and so and also they would probably after their stint go and try something of their own so what are the pieces of advice you can give these people on the like on the focus of product what kind of products work what is it that we lack or if we had better off would make more larger number of better startups that we have in this region first i would say i'm jealous of them uh, pk mm-hmm. i think uh, the the time is perfect uh, you know like i mentioned earlier the speed with which our market is moving uh, it doesn't feel like us pushing a boulder uphill anymore uh, there is a natural momentum in the market the capital is available mm-hmm. teams are available engineering talent is available the consumer base is looking to adopt the latest greatest best ui and most useful product so there is a in many ways a perfect storm that is getting created that should aid and help a first time founder like never before so uh it's a great time to start up that's my first message uh if you are still having doubts and you're wondering whether you should leave that job leave it <laughs> and and do <they're> doing- <laughs> Uh, this is the right time to step out and take the plunge and go make uh, your dreams come alive now entirely expecting it that not everything you touch will succeed and that there will be more dark days before it all works out but it just is worth it if you will uh in in the bigger scheme of things um uh, look my advice to them is stay real and what i mean mm-hmm. by that is it is very easy in this world to uh, get carried away with things that actually don't matter the only thing that matters really is you identify a problem and when i say identify you really understand the problem and why the current solutions don't work and then you go to work with your blinkers on with your head down as much time as it takes to try and figure out a solution or a product that works and you know what the customer tells you when it works they tell you not by paying you as much as spending time on your product uh and you know the engagement level and the fact that they go and spread the word if there were two metrics i cared about as an early stage investor that i would ask an early stage founder to care about it's word of mouth that is how many times has someone who's used you told somebody else that they must use you and how often has that person come back to use you so retention and repeat and word of mouth are the two early metrics that suggest you've got product market fit that's beginning to kick in and once you do that again just keep your head down don't get carried away with large rounds and large amounts of capital or valuation honestly that just doesn't matter the money chases you as your customers and your revenues begin to click into your company so don't do it the other way around where you feel like you need to first go raise capital and only then you'll be able to produce some of those things it's really the other way around correct so mohit before i get into mohit the person i wanted to ask one question from you which is you know tell us about 
one particular area segment company which you are very bullish about which finally didn't work out which is something which was everybody was bullish on you were you invested you know you don't want to be specific about a company that's fine or if you have somebody to talk about please tell us i'll give you uh, two or three actually so that you learn from my mistake yeah. don't repeat them the first one is i remember going and visiting the sequoia china team and seeing something in the uh, in the mapping space you know this is the old days of people needing to navigate uh, their automobiles and uh-huh. and you had these very specialized devices that used to be called tom toms and so on and so forth correct I remember coming back and scanning the space in india and saying we don't have that in india we must do it and i basically made an investment because it was a so and so of that in india bad idea uh, i uh-huh. think if you if you don't think first principles and you don't think about the actual problem in india and why it d- deserves to be here or not you can easily go wrong by trying to look for a equivalent company that exists in other parts of the world that was my big wake up call that that's just very superficial thinking and and dangerous uh, to put it in the least and sure enough that whole space finally got disintermediated and disrupted by google maps and and you know that those companies yeah. don't exist anymore uh mm-hmm. second area is uh i would say many companies have products that actually look pretty nice in terms of ui and ux and many founders are very slick and they do a really good job on presentation um and i came across a company where we invested this is the largest check i wrote that actually went to zero so this was my biggest uh it was a 20 million dollar check so i lost a lot of money on this one this is the personal pain that i still haven't completely resolved if you haven't sensed it uh and, and and i asked myself the same question that you're asking me which is you know what went wrong and it took me many years actually to try and figure that out as to what exactly did not work out what did i miss and there were two learnings for me the first is the product worked but it was eh, all right it didn't completely change and you know my friend kunal uh, shah says this well as you know if you don't have at least a large degree like it shouldn't just be a little bit better it has to be vastly better in order for people to leave what their current choices are and to jump to your product and solution so i think the problem that we were solving was well serviced by the existing people and the way we solved it didn't completely change it and didn't completely re uh-huh. sort of imagine the experience which i think was a big mistake and the second one was i feel like i backed a very interesting uh founder but not someone who uh, was willing to sort of go through the inevitable very tough periods of time and those periods of time come in every startup's life and you still need those people who just are you know dogged if you will and resilient and persisting through these toughest times rather than folks who say you know what you know maybe we've had it and i'm ready to throw in the towel uh uh-huh. uh that's true so mohit the last question before we wind up today what drives mohit the person what are your hobbies what are things which drive you besides writing checks you know i don't know what it is uh, pk but uh, one of my highlights of last year was we as in a group of uh, investors from our startup ecosystem across axel and kalari and sequoia and mm. uh, lightspeed and everyone and then a bunch of um, founders uh, mukesh and abhiraj and many many others came together to create this thing called act and it was basically this thing called act covid team which was this platform where we said hey let's quickly raise about 100 crores which is what we finally did and then gave grants to very innovative ideas to try and fight uh, the pandemic whether it was creating startups mm-hmm. that actually created you know contact tracing software or very innovative oxygen solutions or you know n95 production in india and that made us all say i can said you know more than the money the fact that we had the brain power of the startup ecosystem and we had the access to the network of the startup ecosystem this was very powerful in creating solutions and being able to launch them very rapidly with the help of government and so what we've decided to do is actually broaden act and allow them to you know we want to raise another 100 crores for education startups and solve hard to solve problems in india's education system think of 70% of indian kids today uh who are out of school don't have devices while a lot of our kids are you know studying online many kids in india just don't have access so there are some really hard solved problems in india education system that i think the startup ecosystem should apply itself to environment if you live in delhi uh, all you need to do is you know just go through our winters and you'll see the air quality or if you live in bangalore you know 
many of the lakes are catching fire. So, you know, water, air are um, massive issues. And what can the startup ecosystem do by coming together? And so we're going to broad-based act and make it all about essentially giving grants to profitable and non-profitable companies who have very interesting ideas to go tackle these hard-to-solve problems. And that's sort of uh, on top of mind for me these days. How wonderful, Mohit. Thank you so much for all this insight. The time is less. We have to wind up. And thank you so much for spending the time, sharing the insight, and telling us who the game changers would be for the coming years. Thank you so much. Thanks, PK. Thanks, everyone.